Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Van Dyke, and um, I run a lab uh, where we focus on biomedical machine learning. Um, I'm part of both the Department of Internal Medicine as well as Computer Science. So in our lab, we work with all kinds of data sources. And in general, these data sources are big biomedical data. So we work a lot with single cell RNA sequencing, uh, but we also do gut microbiome sequencing. We work with medical imaging and electronic health, health records, uh, as well as other sources of imaging. Um, I also work in neuroscience, in particular on calcium imaging, and we do some work on predicting uh, biochemical reactions. So the core technology of our lab is the algorithm. So it's the machine learning. And in general, we set out to develop new machine learning methods and apply these to these data sets. Um, and we work, we work as generally two kinds of computational technologies. So one is, is graph theory and graph signal processing, and another is deep learning. So um, in the past years, we've been working a lot with single cell RNA sequencing, uh, but we're gradually expanding out to other data modalities. Um, and um, I'd like to show you a couple of projects that uh, we have that, that are in different phases of completion. So some projects we've already finished and some are currently going on. Uh, just to give you an idea of sort of the kind of uh, work we do in our lab. So this first project is based on uh, single cell RNA sequencing. So one challenge with single cell sequencing um, is that the data is incredibly noisy and incredibly sparse. So ideally you would want the data to look like this where we have cells and genes and we have very clear structure in the data. However, in reality, this is what the data looks like. So it's incredibly noisy. And in fact, the majority of the data is missing. So this is a problem because this obscures the underlying uh, biology. So to solve this problem, we developed uh, an algorithm called MAGIC, where the idea is to learn from, for a cell, learn from its neighbor, neighbors, exchange information and in the process, fill in the missing values. So we set out with this very simple idea where we said, well, if we can find two cells that are biologically similar, ideally identical, they will be missing different values because the, 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 the noise, the underlying noise process is random. Um, and as such, they can exchange information and in the process they can fill in the missing values. Um, however, it turns out that finding the, these biologically similar cells is very difficult because the neighborhood in Euclidean space does not actually reflect a biological neighborhood, as you can see here in this, in this cartoon. So, to correctly find neighbors, we have to actually learn this biological neighborhood, which is actually represented by a manifold. So a manifold is a lower dimensional smooth uh, space that is often embedded in high dimensional space. So the way we learn this manifold is by taking small local steps and in the process learning the global shape of the data. Uh, and we implement this, these local steps via random walk, which is equivalent to a diffusion process. So we use a diffusion process or a data diffusion process to learn this uh, manifold. Uh, so since we're doing Markov affinity-based graph computation, we call our algorithm magic. Um, and we applied our algorithm to um, an epithelial to mesenchymal transition data set. So we measured uh, 20,000 approximately single cells uh, from a breast cancer cell line that we induce with TGF beta to undergo this EMT transition. So the cells originally are epithelial cells, but when you stimulate them with TGF beta, they gradually transition towards the mesenchymal cells. So this process, the EMT, is a very fundamental process in biology, and it's uh, actually involved both in sort of healthy and disease processes. So in healthy processes, it's involved in development and things such as wound healing. In disease, it's, it's um, involved in cancer metastasis. Uh, so we measure the cells and we run our algorithm and gradually uh, we can recover the underlying structure in the data. In particular, we can identify epithelial cells on the right and mesenchymal cells here on the left. But actually, as you can see, most of the cells are 
uh, somewhere in between. So they're transitioning from one state to another. And our algorithm was able to identify these states. So after doing this imputation, after sort of fixing the data, we identify that we can, we can observe that, that there's this complex cellular state space going on, or phenotypic state space. Uh, so we set out to quantify that state space. In particular, we use this technique called archetypal analysis to ident identify these extremal states in the data. We're able to identify several epithelial states, mesenchymal states, um, as well as apoptotic states, so states where cells die. And perhaps most interestingly, and this was sort of new, is we, we were able to identify several intermediate states that um, showed uh, stem-like signatures. So this suggested that cells transition from the epithelial to the mesenchymal states, they first undergo some kind of reprogramming step where they become more stem-like. Okay, so another project that is based on single cell RNA sequencing is a project where we set out to predict disease state from single cell data. So this project um, was led by two postdocs in the lab, Arjit and Neil, um, and was a collaboration with uh, the lab, lab of David Heffler, who's at uh, Neurology and Immunobiology. Um, so David Heffler is an expert on, on multiple sclerosis. So in this project, they measured a really large data set um, of both healthy individuals and MS patients in, in single cells, as you, uh, you can see this, the subject here, subjects here on the right. So we measured both blood and cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, the point is that we measured many, many single cells in many different individuals, right? Uh, healthy and, and disease, in this case, MS. And the idea is, can we use the single cell data to predict disease state? So both at the single cell level, but also at the sample level, so at the patient level. So to do this, we used a uh, technique that is a quite recent development in machine learning, which is called graph neural networks. So graph neural networks sort of merge uh, graphical data and machine learning. Um, and uh, graph neural net networks um, turn out to be really powerful in, in some specific applications. And we thought that this technique could be useful in single cell data because often single cell data, the first step what we do with the data is build a graph. So we thought, well, we have this graph, we can use graph neural networks to then do computation on this graph. So in this uh, method, we started with our gene expression data, single cell data, we build a KNN graph, and then we have a graph neural network model on this graph uh, that we train to predict the identity of the cell. So each cell is, comes from a healthy individual or an MS patient, and we have the model sort of classify that. And, and the result is that we have a tool that can be used potentially for diagnostics, but it, can also, but it also identifies what genes and what cell states are particularly important to distinguish between healthy and MS. And we can also use this tool for, for visualization. Um, so we have been working a lot with single cell data, as I mentioned, and as I showed you examples of. However, we don't just work with single cell data. So in this particular project, which was, is led by my student, Antonio, um, in this project, we're working together with uh, Stefania Nicoli, who's in, in genetics in the Cardiovascular Research Center, she works with zebrafish. Her lab um, is expert on zebrafish, and in particular, they are interested in the zebrafish brain morphology. So they use confocal imaging to measure the brain, to image the brains of zebrafish, and in three dimensions, right? Because confocal imaging is, is with three dimensions, with X, Y, and you have Z slices. And they measure, they do these measurements on fish in all kinds of conditions. So different time points in development, different genetic backgrounds, different, per, different environmental perturbations. And as you can imagine, measuring the whole brain, the morphology, this constitutes a complex phenotype, right? There's many different you know, processes and mechanisms involved in, in, in making them, creating the morphology of a brain. So the idea in this project is, can we relate these brain, this, this complex phenotype of brain morphology to these conditions? Uh, both the genetic and environmental conditions. And can we use machine learning to, to do that? So this is an example of what the data looks like. So um, 
the underlying data is, is three dimensional, right? But here I'm showing um, sort of the, the, the just, just one view, sort of this is uh, all the Z slices added together. Um, so the, the, the measurement is done in different time points, as you can see here in, in the rows. And on the columns is just different, um, um, different fish, so just variability. So the idea is to relate these images and patterns in these images to the environmental to, or to the experimental variables, if you will. So to do this, we both use an unsupervised and a supervised approach. So an unsupervised approach, we don't use any of the labels. So we just take our input images, we run it through a convolutional autoencoder and try to reconstruct the images. And in the process, we learn some meaningful, hopefully meaningful latent space that we can extract. Uh, for example, for visualization, as you can see here, these two plots uh, represent the learned manifold or, or phenotypic state space. Every point here is an image or is a, is a fish, zebra fish, brain. And as you can see, this manifold correlates with the experimental uh, variables such as genotype or developmental time, even though we didn't train it to do that, right? So but it was completely blind. We didn't um, train it to predict these labels, yet it still can distinguish between these different conditions. Uh, and a second approach is to do actually a supervised learning. So here we do have the labels and we have a, a, a convolutional neural network, a deep convolutional neural network that takes the input images and tries to predict our experimental variables, for example, developmental time. Um, and uh, our model is very successful at doing so. In the process, we can use, after training, we can use what is called saliency analysis to identify um, patterns in the data that are particularly predictive of these experimental variables. And in the process, we can learn something about the biology. So another project that is based on imaging and also actually of the brain, but actually in a very different way, this is actually neuroscience, um, also led by my student Antonio, is a project where we use machine learning to identify spatial temporal motifs in wide field calcium imaging data. So this is a collaboration with the Carden Lab, uh, who's in neuroscience. So they measure uh, the brain, the cortical activity in mice. So these are transgenic mice, um, such that they, uh, you can measure them with calcium imaging. So basically when their neurons fire, they produce some fluorescence and they essentially have a camera on their head or in their brain um, that measures wide field. So it measures the whole cortex, as you can see here in this animation. And while they do these measurements, they present the mice with different stimuli or they just record the behavior of the mouse. So the idea in this project is that we have these videos of the cortical activation we also have data on the behavior and, and, and stimulation of the mice. And can we relate the two, right? Can we predict the behavior from the brain activity and vice versa? And can we find certain motifs, certain patterns in this data that is predictive of certain behaviors? Um, in particular, the idea in this project is to sort of identify different states. So as the mouse is doing different things, so it's moving, it's sitting, it's looking at things, can we identify different states in the brain as well that relate with these activities? David, just a couple more minutes. Yep. Um, so the way we do this is we do a windowed Fourier transform to decompose the signal into different frequencies. And then we use uh, convolutional neural networks to identify um, patterns in that. Okay. So, um, so this is a project that is, is led by Jason, who's a student in my lab, and he just joined the lab this is very much a new pro project. Um, it's together with the NOAA Palm Lab in immunobiology. And the idea there is to predict uh, biochemical reactions, that enzymatic reactions using deep learning. So the motivation of this project is that there is um, that the majority of microbial genes are genes are not annotated, but they are involved in all kinds of uh, biochemical processes. So we want to use deep learning to sort of annotate these unknown genes and give them a, 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 such that we know their function and then potentially can, can use that function. Um, yeah, that's very brief. There's not much time, so I'll move on. So finally, uh, we also have been involved in several COVID related projects. In this project, we are interested in infection dynamics. This is a collaboration with the Weiland Lab uh, where we measure uh, viral infection 
um, in an in vitro system. So the so the Weiland lab uh, in lab medicine and immunobiology grows lung organoids and affects these with different viruses, including the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and then measures them using single cell sequencing over time. And we use the data to sort of build models and be, uh, and, and try to predict um, viral dynamics. So which cell types are infected? How are they infected? Are there certain cell types and genes that give cells uh, certain protection? Um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll skip this. So as you can see, we work on many, many different domains and systems and diseases, and we are extremely collaborative. We work with many different departments here at Yale. Uh, but the core technology of our lab are the algorithms. And the cool, things about, the cool thing about algorithms is that often you can apply them to many different systems. Um, so we try to be inspired by new problems and new collaborations and try to come up with new computational methods or apply existing methods to solve these uh, problems. So if you're interested in learning about machine learning, and especially if you're interested in, in highly cross-disciplinary research, uh, you should definitely reach out uh, to us. Thank you.